Hi, I'm Gigi Parker Hudnell. I'm your instructor, and we are talking in, um, excuse me, for Drama 1310, Theater Appreciation, uh, in the Theater Brief 12th edition uh, with Cohen and Sherman. And uh, we are going to be looking over just a little bit of Chapter 7. So it's just like the very beginning of it, because I believe that it goes with this how we start theater. Origins of Theater, chapter seven, uh, very beginning of it, chapter seven A. So how did theater start? So theater has, it, it exists, you know, right now in the present, but of course it's very, very rooted in the past. Um, there have been people that have been doing some sort of theater for since people were around, since, you know, little children play dress up and who knows with the cavemen, they were probably, you know, using their uh, cave mama's, you know, cape and pretending to be the mama, <laughs> who knows. But many of the world's greatest plays are actually based on preceding plays. So even though we do a lot of theater now, we do a lot of reflecting, a lot of retrospect. Um, just in the plays that we present right now. There are a lot of revivals that are out there that are talking about, you know, the different plays that we've already done. So you will still see versions of Oedipus Rex being shown, even though that was, you know, fifth century BC. So French neoclassicists of the 17th century, they based a lot of what they did on the Greek and Roman models. They found, um, we talked about uh, Aristotle and his poetics, and they found those poetics, and they looked at what tragedy is, and they, they based a lot of their um, subject matter on old Greek and old Roman myths and the, the way that they had structured their plays. And at least three of Shakespeare's plays are revisions of earlier plays. So King Lear, Taming of the Shrew, Hamlet, those were all plays that somebody else had written and Shakespeare rewrote them. We know that the story of Romeo and Juliet is, um, it was a story and he took it and adapted and made it into the play that we now know as Romeo and Juliet. So um, there's always kind of a nod to what was before. And Western theater includes Europe and the Americas while Eastern theater includes Asia and India. So the Eastern theater that we see, they also, um, you know, do a nod back to other myths that were indigenous in that part of the world. Okay, so origins of theater. The first known dramatic presentations actually occurred in Northern Africa. So before Greece, um, it was along the Nile River at least 4,500 years ago and possibly as early as 3300 BC. So that is a very long time ago. Um, and these are things that we knew that we happened. We have some sort of evidence that people were impersonating other people or other things. Um, there are two foundations that are, that are kind of like, it's, it's Eurocentric, but it's kind of uh, where we get our um, love of theater, our, our acting and stuff. And we believe that these were based both in ritual and in storytelling. Okay, so ritual. I'm about to show you this little video. And this is, um, you know, the, a ritual is really de defined as a collective ceremony by members of a society. And it's normally for religious or cultural reasons. Let me um, click on this. It's not letting me show you yet. Uh, well, okay, well, we'll talk about this. Travel rituals arose to celebrate important life events, marriages, deaths, births. Um, we still do rituals. Um, I happen to be Catholic and in the Catholic church, we have baptisms and we have babies baptisms and we have them wear white for, you know, to symbolize their purity and, um, so there are a lot of rituals that go on. 
you live in San Antonio, Texas, you I'm sure you've seen or heard of a quinceanera. And it's another kind of a ritual thing that we do. Weddings are rituals. Um, early rituals kind of grew to staging and costuming and makeup and music and singing and props. We have all these things in the theater and we have all these things in our rituals. Again, if you've ever planned a wedding, um, you have all those things. And uh, Western secular rituals included, uh, you know, black robes on judges. Judges wear black robes today. Um, we have choreography in the changing of the guard in front of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Virginia. And uh, we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. All of those things are very ritual-based. I think down here, someone said that it's called the, the Kichak Dance of Bali, Indonesia. So that's a, a ritual that's actually still going on today, which is actually pretty cool. So rituals kind of give us enhanced meaning and authority to things that are going on around us. And so it's out of this birth of this kind of ritual thing that theater kind of started. Another way that theater could have started or another um, origin is in storytelling. Now we tell stories all the time. We tell stories of our, you know, our traffic on the way to work. We tell stories of, oh my goodness, do you know what happened to me at the grocery store? Um, on, you know, on the way to school, do you know what the teacher said to me? So, um, but storytelling also kind of, it, it gives an element of character and personalization. So, Character impersonization, impersonation, impersonation, impersonization, character impersonation. And what I mean by that is you will be talking about how you were driving and how this, this person yelled at you and you will give a voice to that person that yelled at you. They yelled at me and they said, hey, stay out of the way, um, whether they talk like that or not we tend to impersonate people when we're telling stories. Um, it, oops, it seeks, it, it means to convey character emotions. 
we're trying to entertain people and also show them what happened. And ritual make things, makes things larger than life and storytelling makes things more personal and affecting. It's actually a storytelling contest. Good evening. Storytelling is among the oldest of human activities and is often considered to be one of the primary roots of drama. It has been used for centuries as, as a means of entertainment, education, and cultural preservation. Storytelling by children assists them in building language fluency, enhancing writing ability, and constructing their own worldviews. They also learn the form of retelling how to be a good listener. Tonight, you will hear from our very still storytellers. Some of the rules the students needed to follow were, all stories must be retold from published material. Stories were to be no longer than five minutes. In length, stories were to be told from memory and body language, emotion, and voice were to be used to add detail and interest to the story. Next up, we have Ethan. Work, work with me. <laughs> Shoulder, find it hard to 
butt to put it balanced on it. And so when he's passing by with the donkey on the, his shoulder, those, the school in the window that has never spoken a word in her life, the doctor said she wouldn't get better, so so I made her laugh. And so that's when Jack was passing by with the donkey on his shoulder, but it holds her hoisted on. And the girl looking out the window, when she saw Jack with the donkey, she burst into a bit of laughter. <laughs> and so she was better. And so the whole problem was which. And so his, and so he came running out of the house saying, Lazy Jack, Lazy Jack, will you marry my daughter? And Lazy Jack replies, yes. So his mom, him, and the girl live happily ever after in a nice home. The end. for Ethan and for being our gold medalist, a $25 gift card to Borders. Good job. Okay. Um, it, it, he impersonated a different characters. He, he might've got the story a little bit mixed up, but he was in third grade and he was absolutely adorable. But he conveyed the emotion and it was meant to entertain. So um, it made it personal too, because he was telling the story. The other thing about um, where ritual and theater comes from, it's all kind of tied into uh, shamanism, trance, uh, magic. When, when I think of things like this, I think of, um, uh, you know, like uh, Native American cultures and things like that. And that they were humans who would assume like a spiritual role. They would embody animals or other spirits. And they were kind of like the go-betweens between the, the people on earth and the heavens or the spiritually bodies. And these particular people were called shamans. And so this is another origin of theater. These people impersonating or taking on the, the characteristics of something else or somebody else. So that kind of started with that. Um, and th this has been identified in tribal cultures since at least, you know, 13,000 BC. We have had this kind of thing that has gone on. And so it is just yet another possible origin of theater. And the shaman's mask, you know, the shaman, they still have the mask. They say that the shaman's mask has kind of outlived the ritual it was originally used for. The mask was to um, guard them against the, you know, the effects of becoming whatever entity this was. And so now we have masks and we have very colorful masks and things to signify all the different deities that it was. So um, the last thing is we talked a little bit about Egypt and we talked about the the drama that we have from that time period um, and there were a lot of theatrical presentations and performances certainly in sub-Saharan Africa as we know that that's where um, life started so um, the first written records that we have of this activity are from Egypt and they date back to at least 2500 BC and this is called the Abydos Passion Play. And this is just a little blurb about it. It's not the whole play. You think we have soap operas now? Well, get ready for an ancient story of betrayal, love, and battle supreme. Hi, I'm Dan Michalko, host of the Amazing Science Emporium on WCBE, Central Ohio's NPR station. According to ancient Egyptian myth, Osiris and his wife Isis were Egypt's beloved first rulers, who served as king and queen of Egypt at the beginning of time. Osiris was the ideal king who introduced civilization to the Egyptians. Osiris's brother Seth became so jealous of this good and just king that he plotted with 72 conspirators to kill him. Seth secretly measured Osiris's body 
and then commissioned an elaborately decorated human form box built to his measurements. When the box was complete, Seth invited Osiris to a party. During the festivities, Seth ordered that the box be brought into the room and announced that the person who fit exactly inside it would receive the box as a gift. When it was Osiris's turn, the box fit him perfectly. As Osiris lay in the box, all the conspirators rushed to its side, nailed it shut, and sealed it with molten lead. Seth then threw the box into the Nile, and Osiris drowned. With Osiris gone, Seth took over the throne. When Isis heard of this story, she searched everywhere for the box and secretly returned it to Egypt. Isis used magic to bring Osiris back to life, briefly, so that they could conceive a child. Osiris then proceeded to the netherworld to become king of the dead and judge there of who was worthy to enter. Aided by her sister Nephthys, Isis secretly raised her son Horus. When Horus grew up, he sought to avenge his father's death and take his rightful place as the king of Egypt. According to myth, Seth and Horus went head to head in a series of competitions. In one competition, Seth took the form of a hippopotamus, a symbol of chaos. Ultimately, Horus defeated Seth and became king of Egypt. All ancient Egyptians wanted to imitate Osiris at their death by being placed in a fitted box and reborn into the afterlife. Um, basically, we are there now at the end of um, this particular lesson. Let me stop sharing for a second. So it's kind of a short one, and um, it's because it's just a very small, brief part of chapter seven that I just wanted to make sure that we covered um, now here in the beginning when we're talking about what is a play and what is theater and how did we all, how did it all start? So um, I hope that, um, you know, kind of enlightened you a little bit. And if you have any questions, let me know. Have a great day.